Okay, continuing from where we left off. Um, so why is this really important as far as biology goes? Um, these energy pyramids, like we talked about with uh, human growth population or the uh, birth and death rate, um, we can follow energy as it moves uh, throughout the ecosystem. And um, we can understand, really, the inefficiency of food chains. Um, at any point in time, really only 10% of the energy is being passed along to the next level. And that's why we have um, so many plants and then uh, so many uh, insects or herbivores that are eating those plants and a smaller number of uh, carnivores eating the herbivores and really the smallest number of big, fierce, top predators um, at the very top of the uh, energy pyramid. And that's because um, we have really this 10% rule. Uh, this means that if you um, eat a five pound meal, you're not going to gain five pounds. Um, but where does the rest of it go? Um, a lot of that energy that's in a five pound meal are going to go to cellular respiration, allowing for the functions of your um, cells to go on or uh, may be lost as feces and really only 10% of that five pound meal are go is going to stick around. So um, in humans, uh, vegetarianism is much more energetically efficient than uh, meat eating because if 10% uh, of the energy is passed along, then um, really it's better for you to eat grains, eat the primary producers, much more efficient to eat primary producers than it would be for you to actually eat something that was a carnivore. And so um, if we look at that in terms of a uh, pyramid, here at the bottom you can see our primary pr producers. There's the largest number of, uh, of plants out there. And then 10% um, of that biomass goes into the primary consumers. And so the primary consumers, um, after they eat all of the primary producers, only pass along 10% of that energy to the next level. 90% of the energy is being lost to cellular respiration or, and lost as heat. Um, and really only 10% is being converted to biomass at each one of the steps. That's why we have uh, a large amount of primary producers, uh, less primary consumers, even less secondary consumers, and then even less tertiary consumers. Imagine if there were as many great white sharks as there are plankton in the ocean. Um, it just wouldn't even be possible. Or imagine if there were just as many lions in Africa as there are uh, blades of grass. Um, only 10% of the energy is really capable of being passed along to the next level. And then all of the other energy is um, lost due to inefficiency. So if I were to ask you a question on your test, like uh, you go out to eat at a fancy restaurant, you can have a salad, salmon, and for dessert, ice cream. Which part of the meal is the most energy efficient food for you to eat? Um, it's going to be the one that is closest to the sun on the food chain. So um, it would be the salad. Um, so then in looking at uh, different types of species and looking at their interactions um, and how those influence the structure of communi communities, um, what we find is that interacting species are often evolving together. Um, in an environment, we tend to see things that are, are pollinating other plants or uh, things that are trying to get food from plants. And so you might ask a question like, which came first, the long-tongued moth or the long-tubed flower? And the answer is that they uh, might have both started off as independent species and then as the moth learned that he liked to eat um, the pollen inside of the flower or suck up the pollen, uh, then uh, the flower could have evolved so that um, the, the tube of the flower started to get a little longer and then only the moths with the longest tongues could reach inside of that flower and uh, get that, that, uh, that nectar out of them. And then as the um, plant 
continued to evolve to have a little longer tube. Only the moth with the longest tongue could reach down inside of it. And then over the course of generation after generation or even uh, thousands or millions of generations, we could have it so that they have, um, they have evolved together and that's called coevolution. So natural selection causes organisms to become better adapted to their environments. We really see some amazing adaptations uh, that explain the way that um, things have co-evolved in the environment. And what we find is that nature doesn't distinguish between biotic and abiotic or living and non-living factors, uh, but those living and non-living factors are a selective force in, uh, in the natural selection of adapted organisms. And so if you think about uh, something like penicillin, penicillin was first isolated from a fungus growing on a plate of bacteria. You saw this during your, um, during your antibiotic resistance lab. Uh, this is an example of an adaptation of fungus to fight off the bacteria. This interaction could be described as uh, co-adaptation, co-evolution, uh, symbiosis or predation. Uh, this would be co-evolution. The penicillin is going to evolve um, along with the bacteria. And so this is how we see things like antibiotic resistance uh, occurring um, that we can watch happening in the laboratory right now. So um, what you really need to look at when you're thinking about co-evolution is um, where do these uh, species, populations, communities, where do they exist? Um, so what we call that is the niche. A niche is a complete way of living. A bald eagle doesn't exist in isolation. It exists as part of a population. Um, it requires a certain amount of space um, over a uh, territory. It has uh, types and amounts of food that it utilizes. Um, it has a time of year that it's going to reproduce. It's got certain temperature requirements, moisture requirements, and that's going to affect its living conditions. So nothing on this earth exists in isolation, including humans. We all have requirements too. Um, and so that's something to keep in mind as we talk about the way that communities exist. Um, one of the things about nature, nature is that uh, nature doesn't uh, doesn't necessarily change to meet the needs of an organism. It's really the organisms that are going to change to uh, be able to live under these uh, environmental conditions. And if they can't live under those environmental conditions, this is when we start to see species going extinct. So you can't always get what you want. Um, in a fundamental niche, we have the full range of environmental conditions under which a species can live. In a realized niche, this is where and how a species is actually living. So if you look back here at the um, areas where a bald eagle is going to live, you can see that um, a bald eagle's range during the summer is different than that during the winter. And there's really only a specific area that it does live. So there's lots of places that they could live, but then there's certain reasons that keep them in a place there where they do live. Another example of this would be um, the rats of Boston. So if you think about all the places a rat can actually live, um, that's going to be a much larger area than the places where rats actually do live. And so the rats in Boston are, are um, actually their own species that live underground in the, um, in the sewer systems and they've grown to be excessively large um, because they are very well adapted to the environment that they live in. They could live uh, even further outside of their uh, areas but they do only live in the, in the sewer systems. And so what we see is that all of these organisms are going to be competing with one another um, and even though we may not understand what the competition is, we as humans certainly don't ex understand how every organism out there um, exists. We learn more and more about this as we go out and make better observations. 
But even things that we don't understand or forces that we don't understand, um, those things are still going to um, influence the community structure. So um, even if we don't understand the evolutionary forces of uh, that act on finches out on the Galapagos Islands or the uh, giant tortoises, that doesn't mean they're not there working. It just means we don't understand them. Um, will we eventually uh, get an understanding of them? We will continue to, to learn more and more about them every day. Uh, but you can never say that you will completely understand how a uh, ecosystem works. So uh, in this case with the uh, finches, what we see is um, we see something called character displacement. Um, if we have two finches that have medium-sized beaks and they uh, live on two different islands um, and they eat uh, similar foods, if the environment starts to change and there's large seeds on one island and small seeds on the other island, then the organisms that are the best adapted to eat the large seeds are going to see an expression of those traits that make them able to best eat the large seeds and the ones that are best able to eat the small seeds are going to um, lead towards having that, those smaller beaks that allow them to best eat the smaller seeds. So since we see the environment constantly changing in periods of drought and periods of uh, increased rainfall, we see evolution leading in the shift of these beak sizes and we call these change, changes character displacements. And character displacements are what ultimately lead uh, to new species being formed over um, shorter periods of time.